had um, reduced greenhouse gas as part of the other goals. It just seems worth, it's worth having its own goal. So the last one is a new one, ECC4, which is just reduced greenhouse gas emissions, and just moved over two paragraphs that were elsewhere. So it doesn't, I mean, it's not any different than before. It just sort of, if you just skim the plan and look at the top goals, it stands out. That wasn't the minutes, but you and I talked to the phone, we talked about finish that for lots of people. Um, yeah, your you know, I don't, I'm not sure if we had noticed it, but it was what was in front of us. Okay. And, um, yeah. So that's the only changes. I'm open to anything else. The process is, I'm sure I want to make sure you're all happy with this. We're then going to the planning board, eventually new public forums. So let's come back to you. I want to make sure you're as happy with it as possible before we start. So one question I have for you is that this, I mean, it sounds like the timing is going to be great to uh, fit in any comments or suggestions that are coming from the strategic energy plan initiative, right? Because uh, if you look at what we have, people are offering a wealth of ideas. Yeah, yeah. our general time, is probably the next six months doing this sort of process that you've done in the last three months with a bunch of different committees. At the same time, we're finishing the, the STAR committee's assessment. And then sometime in the winter, I'd like it to be January, but maybe April, the time we get to it, then we'll go back to the community for the bigger process. The only other thing, I don't know to what extent you talked about the last meeting, so maybe, I don't want to repeat a conversation again, but if you look on page 18, what you see is, you know, we haven't finished the start communities, we went through sort of the quick and dirty of where did it seem like we're going to get points and where did we not get points. And so, if you haven't done this already, it's worth looking at each of the no's in this and saying, I mean, we don't have to do everything Star wants us to do, so they shouldn't drive us. But at least I want to look at their recommendations and say, you know, did they bring up a good idea we should do, or do you want to blow them off? So it's worth looking at all the no's and saying, first, do you think we're actually doing it and just missed it? Second, should we do it for not doing it, or do we agree that we shouldn't be doing it? And we can Whatever, I don't know how much time we have. If you want to do that now, just go through each one. We can do that now, otherwise you could think about the next four months and come back to you. We can have a conversation then, whatever works better time is. Um, I think we've got enough time. Uh, uh, we'll go through it right now if they want. So. Okay. All right, so let me just walk you through the then. So climate change adaptation plan. So we do a lot of stuff on climate change mitigation. Um, that's how we reduce climate change emissions. We are, we have a five-year all-hazard plan which was done in order to be eligible for FEMA money. And we're hoping to, it runs out in about a year. We're hoping to revise it. We've, we've applied for funds and the idea of revising it is to think about not only natural hazards in the existing system, but natural hazards that might be worsened by climate change. But that's not the same thing as a full adaptation plan where you might be thinking about are there storm sewers that are at the right elevations? Or are there, I'm making this up because I'm learning about buildings, but are there buildings that would leak under five inches of rain that have never leaked in the past because we didn't have those sort of storms? So, you know, whatever those things are. And so I guess that's the question is do we want to do that sort of adaptation? Wouldn't it make sense given that this is going to be kind of a pretty hot topic coming up in the city? Particularly as it relates to stormwater management um, fees that are about to be assigned to adapt to the criteria established by the feds and the state, that it might be part of a comprehensive package. And seeing how the Board of Public Works is already working on this in some way, to somehow attach this. I mean, not, not do a comprehensive plan, but to do a cooperative plan. Yeah, I suppose. Part of stormwater. That makes sense. I mean, obviously, we, what we don't have that scares a lot of communities is sea level rise or those sorts of things. So it's not such a big deal for us. Stormwater is still not the only thing, but I'm sure the biggest thing. Well, I mean, we are surrounded by the exact same levee system that surrounded New Orleans. At the same time, the same system, <laughs> Army Corps of Engineers. I was going to say, built by the same people. Built by the same people. Um, our groundwater is pretty high, too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just any, anyone wants to go back. under the bridge after the last deluge. The trucking bridge is also the the car drowning bridge. Okay. 
So second one in here, and this one is it doesn't really necessarily fit a small community, but internal decisions are most climate change science, you know, use the most current science and staff monitors climate change impacts. That we do, but that when you actually look at, I mean, it sounds like it should be yes, but when you actually look at the criteria they say is that we have experts, you know, scientists who are on this committee or on some equivalent. So we sort of do it by monitoring literature and by being aware. Would there be yeah. experts, say, at UMass or Smith or yeah, Smith sir. that we could probably pull in? Put together on this committee? Oh, or just as advisors. Hey, as advisors, yeah. probably. Right? I mean, that's one of the beauties of having Smith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You're getting my points out. That's good. <laughs> I bet we want to get points if we actually do it as opposed to putting the plan, but the first section of the plan is great. Um, oh, I'm sorry, so actually two and three I was, I was converging together. So three is the one that's actually about the committees. Um, so they specifically say a committee includes all these people, it's number three. And then we said, well, look, we're only sitting 29,000, can it be part of the, the energy commission? I said, yes. So we could do it as part of this. Right. Number four, energy and outreach campaign and climate change vulnerability reduction efforts. I think some of the changes you guys made the last time was focused more on outreach. So I'm not sure if we if that, this no rises to the level of yes or not. Well, again, I mean, in conjunction with the discussion about establishing the fee for stormwater management, climate change actually is is one of the critical impetus for the uh, input I whatever, of the, of the discussion because um, we're being mandated by FEMA and NEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers to accommodate extreme, uh, the yeah. ever-increasing yeah. storm yeah. extremities and uh, so it would seem to me that going along with that, it counts, which should count, right. okay. credit because that's actually, that the BPW is going to include in that an educational okay. aspect of it. So he's probably tagged that on without actually investing the Staff. There's going to be a mailing or something, like the, an effort to get the word out. There'll be mailing and forums and, yeah, I mean, because you're assessing a pretty substantial fee for a runoff and um, in order to get buy-in at the very least, there has to be an understanding as to why you're getting charged for being rained on. Yeah, so it's citywide or just in the city And it's including nonprofits. It's, it's a fee, so it's not just a tax. Mm -hmm. So I would say that uh, the uh, education and outreach with the staff meeting you had on this that came up as something that you know, we probably want to have or it was suggested to run throughout the entire master plan. Uh, you know, everyone yep. at a certain level to it. So if that gets implemented and it gets to be a rather standard communication technique that the city uses, it would be too hard to implement. Okay. Let's do it by the end of the year so we can get credit. Okay. <laughs> right. So, so um, well, we can still improve this. <laughs> so, build comment that. Which, in terms of star points, having things in the plan will give us the credit. Having things in the plan and implementing this was going to take it to get the credit. So, um, so, in terms of number eight, some of Bill's comments going to fit. I mean, I think of this for example as one of our emergency uh, shelter in place things is the uh, senior center, which is in the floodplain except for it's protected by a dike. So, you know, same, it, that may fit. And I don't know enough about the system to know what other, do we have other facilities besides stormwater things, which we might think are particularly vulnerable to climate change. So, it'd be nice to have that here. But, yeah. yeah. Well, I think um, David and I are going to bring something up in a, later on in the agenda uh, that I think would go directly to this. Right. So, um, and I'll, I'll hold that off. Okay. But I think it, it's enough to see. It that. definitely fits in here, Wayne. Okay. All right. We'll come back to that. Okay. Um, require greenhouse gas emissions to be this number actions. Number two, we require greenhouse gas emissions to be considered in broader planning decision making. Um, so I think we do it often. We certainly talk about it often. The require sort of is almost like you know when the planning board issues a special permit. It's not a specific special permit criteria. And when DPW does roads, we're often looking at the no build alternative. But it's not a form. Like in California, if you're building a new road, you have to show that you're net neutral in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And if you're adding a new lane, you have to go buy mitigation elsewhere. So California is statewide, we get credit for this. We have it as part of our conversation, but it's not as formalized. Right, it's not formalized, but 
the PV as of right PV, we, you know, basically say you can't put PV in, and you can't be a forest out to put PV in. Right. And that was simply because of greenhouse gases. But so I think what shows up when we look at this is we do astonishingly good things, but there's a lot of routine things we do. Yeah. So, so road changes, for example. And it's certainly a big one. We don't necessarily incorporate it into it. It's so that's the difference between it, you know. So, um, and so I guess maybe for the two councils, I mean, so we want to try to formalize. That would be a big deal. Is that we want to do a California style assessment? In time, yes, that's a, not a bad idea. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so I'll put that in as a as a action here. It's so not going to be then we get credit for the star because we're probably implement it in this time period. But that was some towards that. Um, increase in community alternative fuel vehicles. This is one of the things where there's just not a lot of data available, so we may not get this. And the next one too, fuel efficient vehicles. We may not get this credit. I mean, I think we're doing this, and just based on looking at our vehicle using the electric charger, this will only increase the number. But unless Chris in particular knows a good source of data, I just can't talk to you about know, one of the things that come to, uh, I was wondering when this might be applicable, but I was at Big Y the other day, and they have two electric car hookup meters, or dispensers. Do you think that they would share their information with us as far as how often those are used and if they're increasing? Yeah. They, they might, I don't know. But I mean, and we, I can give you that information on our six meters. Eight years. Do you know if registered motor vehicles keeps any sort of data on um, any what? Does registered motor vehicles track data? Electric cars. Electric cars. I mean, are we looking at how many cars are electric alternative vehicle vehicles that are being used in Northampton? Because that's the problem. Yeah. With saying how many people using our chargers, they may not be Northampton owned vehicles. Right? Yeah. Um, but if you wanted to go, you know, which ones are owned in Northampton? Uh, I would think car registrations. Yeah, it's probably private though. Sure yeah. Or or even excise tax. Doesn't that have to kind of keep track of what make and model you have to get an excise tax? Yeah, but I think you can search. I don't know how it comes in. I mean, I can look up what Chris Mason owns. I don't know if I could search and say, tell me all Chevy Volts and tell me all something else. Okay. Is that something we could ask? We could be able to tell you who owns them, but we could be able to tell you how many there are. But the, yeah, that's would, the, would the tax office? I don't think Texas yeah. has to be tracking that. Can you reason that before there were electric plugins, there were none, and now there are electric plugins, so we have more? The <laughs> we can pitch it. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> they kind of left the question open, like increase in community vehicles. Right, increase. <laughs> you add one, you increase. That's <laughs> true. Dramatic. <laughs> we never do a good job. Okay. Uh, Number five, strong renewable portfolio standard for investor and utility will help achieve fifty. Because one and two are separate. One and two are separate, but they're the same basic concept: alternative oh. fuel versus fuel efficient. Oh. And they both have the same problem with data. Yeah. You know, I mean, I see Priuses everywhere, so I know we're getting more, but I couldn't tell you what percentage we have today versus right. ten years ago. So both of those are probably either excise tax or into my data. All right, so then five portfolio standard. I'm assuming National Grid has no target of getting 50% more. Um, you probably can speak to that. I mean, what's the mandate from the Energy Efficiency Advisory Committee? I have no idea. Yeah, but is there any kind of a target besides X number of kilowatt hours per year or something? No, no idea. That's something we could ask, like, say, Deirdre Manny. It's Smith College, she's an energy sustainability director. She's on the energy efficiency advisory committee. I'm just going to back this. If you look at the governor's charter for both wind and PV, it's nowhere close to 50%. No. I, I mean, mean, I don't know what it is in the project. Okay, we can check the future. Oh, wait. Renewable portfolio for investor owned utilities that would help achieve. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, renewable, renewable portfolio standard. Yes, we, there, there is a statewide renewable portfolio standard. Is it 50%? It's not 50%. It's something like, I'm not sure where it's at right now, 6%, but it has an annual increase. Oh, 
keeps okay. going up like one or two percent a year. And would it eventually get to 50%? I mean, that's fine, but it is probably. Okay. Um, I think so. The health care is just the utility that yeah. serves us. But yeah, it's not just the market. Right. No, it's right. 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 Well, the renewable, re renewable portfolio standard is a statewide thing that all utilities right. have. Okay. Right. All right, let me follow up. Yes, yes. Here, here. Isn't our, yes. Right. Super sensitive to it. Kind of. Are we to, working to electrify truck stops through this island? <laughs> Do we have any truck stops? <laughs> yeah, it's going to that. Uh, okay, next page. Uh, distribution of infrastructure to further, to further support investment in renewable energy sources. And I guess some of that is the PV. I'm just not exactly sure what I'm looking for. Right, installing PV or actually putting in infrastructure that makes it more useful. Is this your grid? Well, this this gets that? into the microgrid resiliency. So yeah, it, we're going to talk about this one as well. Yeah, long, long term, good. Okay. All right, so same thing for greenhouse gas. I guess you and I need to talk about what you have. You can give us greenhouse gas just from converting energy savings. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm not sure if you have it for other things, but maybe we'll start with that. But Mass Energy Insight actually does it automatically for us. Okay. Is it Mass Energy Insight? Uh, yes, that's the uh, state data tracking software that we use okay. for municipal. It's not citywide, it's just municipal. Okay, I'll talk about it. Okay. 80% uh, reduction in industrial water use. This is probably more of a question for Ned, but and as far as I know, we're not doing. We're not going to have a lot of industrial uses. Anyone know? Um, yeah. Part of the industries and greenhouse gas reporting programs to collect and report emissions and mitigation efforts. Okay. If anybody's doing anything to record that yet? And unfortunately, there's a few things you can see that repeat. The subtle changes between different sectors, but work collaboratively with industry leaders to set targets and strategies to reduce energy and water use. I think we're doing that. Um, oh, with the utilities, working with utilities. For right. Right. We worked with the utilities to help our smaller uh, businesses take advantage of uh, energy efficiency rebates and stuff. And do we actually have targets? And no. But I suppose we could. And I would say if this case of financing becomes reality, uh, I would think the city would probably work collaboratively with our industries to make sure they understand the program and see if they want to take advantage of it. You know, at least introduce it to them. Okay. So, but targets, I don't know about targets. You might just want to talk to the chamber and see if they might have a subcommittee that's dealing with businesses and energy, energy reduction. Parameters. Okay. They, they do um, specifically they, for energy reduction within in industries. It's well, it's green. No, it's it's more of a, it's green. It's overall green, so it includes waste reduction, yeah. recycling, you know, water. Um, also, but also the nature of Northampton, the chamber is mostly towards small businesses right. and um, consulting firms, and not so much. This, this is the industrial sector right here. Okay, yeah. So the chamber is not very big industrial. Sector. So, so the next four sort of fit or those five together, five through nine sort of piece. So then we're on to uh, resource efficient buildings. Incremental project pro progress was 80 percent reduction of greenhouse gas. I know we have us for city buildings, but where do you jump to? Uh, under resource yeah, efficient right under outcomes. Okay. And so this works is if you get points under outcomes, life's really easy. So getting, you know, outcomes say you're actually doing it, which is great. Actions are how you're moving towards doing the future. So the, the Massachusetts climate plan, the state has, has an 80 percent target by 2050, right? For for greenhouse gas and right. reductions. So this one's about can we show a, a, a that we're making progress towards that specific. Yeah, part of their actions in the plan are things like the stretch code and conservation efforts and utility programs. So the whole kind of suite of everything. Yeah. To get there. So because that matches that goal specifically. And again, is that is that municipal or is that community wide? It's an interesting question. We've asked that for a couple of things with the state's doing. If there's a clear for outcomes, they're pretty supportive. For actions, they're less supportive. So there's a clear effect on what's happening in Northampton. We can give credit for things the state's doing that we're not doing, or the nonprofits are doing. For actions, maybe less so. But this particular one we're in is, is outcomes, so that's okay. Okay, so I mean the problem the problem with if it, if you go beyond the municipal. Then yeah. it's hard for us to track yeah. 
because utilities aren't sharing data. Right. Um, so uh, that's the problem we want to show as a result of any policy, whether it's state or city, are we actually getting a reduction in in buildings in Northampton? Right. You know, we can say yes, we have some buildings built in stretch code, but and when we, we did greenhouse gas inventory in 2000, and we could do that again. You know, my only problem doing an inventory um, without any more local data is you tend to use statewide or maybe countywide yeah. data, and then it doesn't really show you what you're doing in Northampton. It just means you know, it's just basically you might be doing great, but if it's it's an aggregate with everybody, then it gets gets lost. So. So there are ways of looking at it, but is, is it fine, fine enough uh, yeah. detail? Okay. All right, so some of the answers have to do with Chris, but okay. so water, I don't think we have. Um, for buildings. Um, building energy efficiency plan for commercial residential and industrial buildings. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> Um, energy and water disclosure ordinance, we've talked about it, but we haven't done anything. We're talking about energy disclosure ordinance. It came up in the um, strat energy strategies group. Oh, good. Or the guy brought it up. Yeah. What's up with that, too? Yeah. It's a good one. Energy disclosure is great. And is that something you as a group are in putting in the plan for the goal? Um, it certainly will be. I mean, the energy strategies hasn't started to try to identify specific uh, actions All right, so it's, that, it's, it, it's in the rough draft. Okay. You know. And I actually know that there's um, uh, a bunch of energy groups are supporting uh, an ordinance, not an ordinance, uh, a bill to the state legislation to um, require utilities to disclose energy use to a certain okay. extent. So that's actually being put forth at the house. The oh, level. so this, this would be an ordinance in the city for Ah, they were like tenant, you know, if someone's renting right. a unit and the landlord has to disclose some okay. kind of use. Or the largest industry, industrial users. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, I don't. Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Right, if the state passed it statewide, that would qualify. But, right. you know, if you just want to pass it. Right. Like Boston has one, New York has one for large multi tenant buildings. Right. All right, so we're up to resource efficient public infrastructure. This is uh, incremental programs with 80% reduction of water use by selected public infrastructure. So this could be everything from metering public buildings so that you know there's incentive for David to watch water use to convincing Smith to redo the jets at the uh, Look Park Water Splash Park so that they recycle the water instead of using it you know, twice, that kind of thing. Um, I think it's known, you know, we're irrigating Florence Fields so we don't increase the amount of water use, but as far as I know, we're not going back in your days. So that's why I haven't put the water map back up and say, oh. I'll talk to you that later. <laughs> uh, require infrastructure managers, this is sort of similar to the thing we talked about before, require infrastructure managers being, you know, David, to consider greenhouse gas and water consumption implications of new infrastructure components. And it's the same, it's the required. I mean, as a practical matter, we're doing that. I mean, I assume that was part of the discussion for the police station building committee and, you know, we're buying things that are low water, but I think require means do we have an ordinance on the books the same way we did for, for cars. We, do, we have, um, do we have an ordinance or a policy to do life cycle costing for any new large infrastructure? Unless it's in the resolution or about LED buildings, lead buildings, lead buildings. don't okay. have their assess. And again, that's a resolution, it's not an ordinance, so it's right. not, it doesn't right. turn into that. Yeah. Okay. But if there was any specific language bill about... No, I but I, I don't have a comprehensive uh, ordinance book in my head. So right. right. It could be an ordinance or it could also be actually given the new charter when the mayor sends you the, all the big package of how city government runs, it could be part of his charge for the functions. Yeah. What's that? Could be an, a, an executive order as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, that's what. But yeah, when we did do the lead design of the police station, and it was uh, sort of vetted from an engineering and operations standpoint by the lead company we hired. Yeah. 
they did a full life cycle analysis. Well, that's why I think this wouldn't be hard to do. I think we're doing this in the done for the last three or four bill right. billions. Senior shadow, I'm sure they yeah. did too. So it's they, just the, the executive order. Maybe, maybe that's the easier way to do it, is have the mayor tell us all to do what we've been doing already. So. Mm -hmm. okay. um, engage public infrastructure, public infrastructure systems managers, which stay directly or indirectly with voluntary greenhouse gas reporting programs. Again, probably the same thing, probably wouldn't be hard to do. Public infrastructure systems managers. So basically, city infrastructure? Yeah, it's basically it's going to be it's, it's, David and Ned. Every other I guess the well, schools. It's, it's all it's all in in, in um, mass energy insight. I mean, all our energy use is mass energy insight. So, if there's something beyond energy use for greenhouse gas emissions, are they um, doing just electricity? Or are they doing okay, heating sources? Yeah, well? heating, propane. It's, okay. it's all it's all energy sources, with, you know, anywhere from gasoline to okay, so propane. Yeah. Okay. But it does it wouldn't get stuff like greenhouse gas emissions from the landfill. Um, but I, so I, I think that probably has to report that anyhow. Okay. Um, and there may be other cases where there's some greenhouse gas emissions, so it may not be inclusive, but it certainly right. covers a big, huge piece okay. of it. And, and I can't speak for Louis because he's not here, but um, the energy conservation section of the building code, uh, part of his examination of project, proposed projects, and assessing them, the code does talk about analyses as far as reducing energy use in a project and having to meet certain criteria. I can't recite okay. off the top of my head, but we do it. It's the home energy rating system. Yeah, but what does that do with the training? Oh, yeah, it's not a training program. So no, I think, I, we're, I think we're still on the... I think we're on the one. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay, right. So that so that software that they require doesn't mm -hmm. complete the work I did. That was kind of mm -hmm. yeah. It has reports that can report Gas emissions. That's only it's, it's not okay. required for, um, it's not required for fresh to submit that report, but right. it is the tool you use to, to generate a report like that. Okay. And then last one here, and then we find other things. So training program for infrastructure operators and energy and water efficiency technique. We may do that, but I don't know. Put that in. You know, we send staff to for training on HVAC, efficiency, right. 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 energy management, training and stuff. So okay, that's yes. Yeah. Okay, that's all I got. All right, let's do that. So should we move on to the next agenda item? Or do you have more? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. John, okay. 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 Okay, so the, uh, actually I think I missed, I, I missed an agenda item here. Um, let me just go back, uh, just real quick, just uh, basically to inform folks that uh, John Kelly uh, has been asked to be the principal, Smith Oak. Um, so he's moved up to be a principal and he won't have time to remain on the Energy Commission. So um, I'll be working with Smith Oak just to identify who the, the newly appointed uh, commissioner. Um, revolving fund expenditures. Uh, this is something I, I, I first put this on here because um, uh, it did suggested that we put the SWIFTCO PV array on the city's insurance. And when I calculated how much that would cost based on their per dollar value, I came up with like $2,000. And I said, wow, that's, you know. And then it turned out there was a typo in an email, and it's actually only two hundred and sixty dollars or so. <laughs> so I no longer that, that's within the five hundred dollar uh, limit you guys have given me. But I'm just going to note that I, I'm going to recommend the energy to, the revolving fund, which is generated by the Smith Book Array, covers the cost of the insurance for the Smith Book Array. So um, unless anybody has an objection to that, that's all we're going to do. Cover is it a climate change related damage cover? I don't know. Yeah. 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 Climate change, I mean, I don't yeah, think Smith Oaks is a god. What is it? Acts of God. Acts of God. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Story. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, then this leads up to a second reason for bringing this up uh, revolving fund expenditures. David and I have something to discuss which we think it may be very appropriate for the revolving funds. 
Hey, do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want to take it from here? Or? Sure. Okay. Feel free to jump in first. Sure. So, what we're going to talk about for a couple of minutes relates to what some of the issues that Wayne was just bringing up as far as infrastructure protection, infrastructure resiliency. Uh, reducing energy use and guaranteeing energy use in municipal infrastructure systems. Um, and the other thing I want you to keep in mind is what's been going on so far, Alabama, it's sort of still at the early stages of the strategic energy management planning process that's now evolving in the city. Um, we were approached last May by an energy consulting development company by the name of Rivermore. And since May, uh, Chris and I have had a number of meetings with Rivermore and National Grid. And the whole gist of this is that because of, whether it's climate change, global warming, uh, poor infrastructure maintenance on their part, wherever you want to tag it to, uh, extreme storms like Sandy, frequency of storms, intensity of weather events, uh, National Grid is slowly reaching the point where they're realizing that they need to do anything and everything in their power to try to either get the lights on as fast as they can once the power goes out from a storm or take steps to ensure that the power doesn't go out in communities. Now, to give you a little bit of perspective, since Sandy, uh, the state of New Jersey, not specific communities in New Jersey, but the state of New Jersey has put $150 million on the table to allow communities to engage in what's called resiliency micro -planning. Now, what that could mean is adding additional generator capacity to back up for municipal operations for what are called high-tier facilities, for high school uh, hospitals, rather, nursing homes, uh, shelter places. Uh, Connecticut has just adopted legislation doing the same thing. So you have New Jersey and Connecticut state government pushing money down to the local level, not waiting for the utilities. Massachusetts, nothing like that has happened so far. Now, maybe it's because Sandy didn't hit us the way it did New Jersey and New York. We're not sure. And I'll jump in here and just say, but the Dow Patrick is strongly behind the idea of micro right. and stuff. So it hasn't. Yeah. So National Grid, uh, probably because they took such a beating in the press and were fined something like $18 million for poor preparedness and poor reaction time to some of the storms we've had lately was looking for a pilot community to come in and work with to basically look at load requirements for specific buildings and infrastructure systems to look at what our sort of top three tier critical facilities are and in Northampton the top number one tier is, is Cooley Dickinson Hospital and then you go down to fire police, nursing homes, Smith Folk is a shelter in place building and then you go down through municipal operations buildings all the way down to key businesses, food stores, things like that. So we've already developed a list of 68 facilities but we interviewed with National Grid uh, this summer along with several other communities and National Grid and Rivermore came back to us and said we want to work with you. We want you to be our pilot community and basically do an assessment of our loads, our requirements, our critical points, uh, what do we already do as far as backup power and with generators and buildings, how can we actually even look at creating what are called microgrids where we could basically loop these three city buildings together uh, by having National Grid come in and change their feeders. What can we also look at as far as, let's say, the solar systems that we've already put in the city? Do we add battery backup for those uh, to increase our sort of off-grid capabilities? And they really presented themselves, National Grid did, as saying, we want you to work with us, we want to work with you, and we're going to fund it. The only thing you have to guarantee is that post-study, you may be willing to put up a portion of the money to increase the generating capacity or increase the batteries or do more solar or whatever the study revealed. Fast forward to about three weeks ago, we met with them again. Now National Grid is saying, we want this to be a partnership where you put up some of the money, we'll put up some of the money, and we'll see where we can get the rest of the money from. 
for the for the after for the, the study for the initial the study. mode assessment critical analyses yeah. development of recommendations phase. It's a it's a multi phase project. So we picked you to, for fifty percent off. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Rivermore um, developed a scope of work to do this phase one analysis of critical loads, critical needs, and recommendations. Um, they are calculating that it's probably around a $300,000 project for them to bring in Sandia National Labs to assist in a hard engineering assessment. Doesn't mean we don't get National Grids engineers to work with us, but again, this is a big sort of behemoth of a utility. They're adverse to change. They don't want to move too quickly, although they know they're under the gun. So our approach now is to say, look, Rick, we're willing to do this with or without you. And we're hoping you're willing to work with us. However, if we put some resources on the table and start the analysis, that could help to nudge them along to jump in with their expertise and, and money. So the $300,000 phase one assessment of critical loads and needs and recommend, development of recommendations, Rivermore is basically scaled it down, same scope, same details, but for $100,000. So we're looking at about a $30,000 investment from the city of Northampton. Rivermore is going to basically put in $30,000 of their own labor for free. And GRID is sort of going to sit on the sidelines and hopefully contribute the remaining 33% to make this happen. The other option Chris can talk about is we would like the mayor to uh, contact Rick Sullivan, the Commissioner of uh, Environmental Affairs, uh, we're, and talk about a possible pilot program through DOER, where they might just come to us if we could do a procurement in the right way and basically get this money from the state and say, look, New Jersey's doing it, Connecticut's doing it, let's go Massachusetts. So Chris and I had a conversation after our meeting the other day with Rivermore, and we said, you know, there is the revolving fund. Um, with the last uh, input of money for this year, we're looking at about $100,000 in the pot, Chris? Yeah, about that. About that. Yeah. And by ordinance, uh, we can only keep about 70 or 70,000 or so yeah, in there. 70,000. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be, yeah, 70,000. Really? Well, now, I don't think you lose, you don't lose it. You're just not supposed to put that much in. Yeah. So we wanted to bring this to the commission. I'll uh, tell you why. I have a meeting set up Chris and me to talk with the mayor and Susan Wright next Tuesday about this whole process. Uh, the mayor is familiar with Rivermore, Rivermore National Grid. They had a briefing back in May. Uh, so he knows that this is in the pipeline, uh, but he doesn't know the latest sort of twist to this with National Grid. And we're going to approach him. So we wanted to bring this to the commission today to see what your thoughts were. Did you think it was a good idea? Uh, could we get a recommendation to use part of that revolving loan money for this purpose? And proceed from there. One, one thing I'll add, um, just sort of, but you know, you know, when Rivermore brought it down to 100,000, <clears> and then they, they said the city could do a third of that, and uh, they would pay for a third of it. But the other third, they're going to take at risk. So they're going to do the project no matter what, um, hoping that they can get National Grid to cover it or the state to cover it. Um, don't let that out of the room. We don't want to say so that. The state <laughs> wouldn't be liable for it if, it, right. if they did. No. Right. And, and, and it doesn't mean that we wouldn't put 30, you know, a third of it up and then uh, have them say we can't finish the project. They're, they really see this as a, they want to be the first ones to do this um, uh, for a business plan. Um, they got to be the first ones to do this. What? I'm sorry. Where are they based? Outside of Boston. Well, you mentioned address some of my concerns. I mean, I think that uh, National Grid, as you said, looked very generous and very progressive in their initial offer. They started to walk it back. Right. Um, and the fact that we are now considering proceeding essentially with or without them takes them off the hook on some level, even with their initial obligation. My concern was how much on the hook would we be? Once this, you know, if we're still standing with the, the contract to be completed with $30,000 still outstanding, 
but you're you're saying that that, that Rivermore's intent on completing the project because they need this model, and and we so the benefit for them is to actually end the national grid is to have us as a model, approvable go-to model that they can they, they can against the legislature. So my concern is, you know, is if we're trying to sell this politically, that um, we be held um, harmless um, for any additional liability that, you know, you know, the, 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 you know, it's, it's almost like a bait and switch on, on some level of on, on, on national grid's part. Yeah, yeah, come in, get the, the dryers. This dryer you're looking for is about to reduce. Oh, well, we're all out of those now, but you might be interested in that. So we, I don't want to, I don't want to. I don't want to be a patsy for a bait and switch, but at the same time, you know, I was thinking about this as you were presenting it, David, and I said, all things being equal, say that they, National Grid didn't even come talk about this. Right. Would it make sense for us to do this just separate? I mean, if we just sort of impulsively came up with this as our own idea, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think, you know, um, we still, regardless of whether you believe in climate change or not, and, I, and I, I'm not really going to waste much time trying to convince the flat earthers who disbelieve it, but the, the, the fact is that we're the Connecticut River Valley. Major storms track up along the Connecticut River starting at the end of the day. We're, it's not like we dodge bullets. We're, we're anticipating more bullets, and I think that, that anything that we do to be proactive, and particularly if we can be held up as a paradigm, I'm all for it. I think that, that makes perfect sense. Let, 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 me, let me give you an example, Bill, of you know, where my thinking is going. I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, and, I, and I do feel, after having worked with GRID since May on this, that all of a sudden it's like, well, we promised we are going to pick you up for the party, but, well, now you have to drive and pick up gas. Right. So it's like, well, right. okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I still want to go to the party. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Are they in the self-conscious in this? Do they recognize the... What you're doing here? Yeah. Yeah. And look, they benefit them, ultimately. Well, yeah. so, and, and so here's, my, here's my point on this. I agree. You know, whether they come to the dance or not, it's worthwhile for us to do. We're looking at increasing our uh, fixed generator, post generator, our behind the meter generating capacity where we could loop three buildings. Right. So, you know, if the, if the EOC at Maine Fire Headquarters, the Emergency Operations Center, goes down for some reason, We've got the police department, and we've got this building here. We can pursue grants, but if there's a microgrid possibility, and let's say grid can come in and reroute their feeder lines, what other capability does it give us? So we couldn't proceed. We can proceed without them. Do we get? Do we potentially get as far for as much money or less money? I don't know if it's correct, but it does make sense to do the analysis, and not just for my buildings. You know, your systems now. I mean, you're the same thing. I mean, this analysis is about life safety. You know, you're, the, you're more at the top of the list in some respects than my buildings are. So, you know, it, it makes sense to me to do it. Um, a question about the analysis. On the technical side, I mean, this, this company, Riversong, wants to create a business model for certain utilities, assumably. So, all this is coming from the utility angle to support microbits. Is there a different kind of analysis if this had nothing to do with utilities and just about like resilience? And, no, the well, power still needs to get to the building too. Yeah. If we're talking a micro grid setup where we're looking at the utility to put in and reroute their yeah. feeders okay. with some generator capacity. And they, one of the reasons they approached North Hampton was because of all the efficiency improvements we've already made and the solar that's been installed. So it requires <laughs> their involvement. Because it, it, it's that. not just popping generators all over the city. Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, better windows to reduce your electric electric and putting occupancy sensors in. You still need to get the electricity of the building, sure. but you need to reduce that load as well as still have a load that you need to be able to feed. The concept of the microgrids came up at the Clean Energy Forum and it's about removing ourselves from the grid in neighborhood scale. Mm -hmm. So that's why I asked. It's like is there is there another alternative that's you know if the grid goes down, the grid goes down there is, the, there is the whole notion of, of, you know, combined heating and power systems. Yeah, because that sounds more micro level, yes. Yeah, yeah. But again, this you focus is just on the municipal operations side, mm -hmm. or your, your, and your critical facilities like cooling deck, like, you know, the food stores, like Smith Boat Fear Shelter. You know, there are 68 critical facilities that have been identified in the city. The 
in this initial phase study is probably going to look at the top step. Sounds like it's totally in their interest to do this, and my main concern is like if they're doing this in these other states, they're going to do the R&D there. That's all funded, you know, from this, from all that money, mm -hmm. and then Massachusetts might pick that up. I mean, it might be why they step back because they have companies there and they're going to focus all their, you know, most of the resources there. So that's how I see it. I mean, are we talking about two years from now needing these systems? We're talking 10, 20, 30, 50 years. And if that's the case, why not wait for two years to see what happens in these two states where so much happen and there's a lot more tension? Okay. So let me, let me, uh, I, I just want to put in, uh, um, so what they would produce for us would be, and this is the kind of getting thing you would do this with National Grid or without. Um, I guess Sandia has been doing this for uh, a lot of military bases, but they've got, uh, they've got one of the reasons why the price is down remarkably low for this kind of project is that Sandia is being um, subsidized by the federal government to try to take this and push it beyond military bases. And River Moore has got his contract with Sandia that they can bring him in and really to use France to do it for to see if this actually works in municipal situations. Um, but they gave us some examples. Uh, they gave us one example from, um, uh, some, I think it was probably a military installation where they did the analysis and they said, in order to um, bring your buildings down to the point where you can pretty much guarantee they won't go down for more than 15 minutes, um, and it will cost you this huge amount of money to do that. <clears throat> um, and in this case, with military facilities, 15 minutes was way, way too long, so they couldn't do that. So they pushed it down to, um, you know, and that was basically just kind of putting a lot of generators in. Um, they then uh, pushed it down, they started adding in microgrid capabilities. And uh, they, they got it down to like 0.7 seconds guaranteed, you know, no, not, not, you're not you're coming with power for more than 0.7 seconds. And the price was far, far lower um, uh, once you got the microgrid capability in. And you were sharing generators and sharing um, PV arrays and stuff like that. So the idea is you would come up with a scenario that says that would come up with a number of options for the Northampton to move forward. One of them could be all behind the meter stuff that we would have to fund ourselves totally. And others would be if you had national grid involved. And their, expect, their expectation is that if you get national grid involved, the price goes way down. So it becomes much cheaper. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, if that it does play out that way, we bring that to national grid. It's a pretty strong incentive for them to, you know, I think you can get some state legislators and stuff to push pretty hard to have them play. And I, but I actually really think national grid's really interested. They, they really are. They just face this bureaucracy that's not used to be innovative at all. So, anyhow. So, Dan, the only other couple of points I'll raise about grid is, I mean, they, they do acknowledge that they have to go on an annual basis before the DPU and talk about their community outreach efforts and what they're doing to streamline and, and make their systems more efficient. So, I mean, what better example? to say that you know they're now working with Northampton on, on this resiliency project uh, that they then can take statewide within their whole service territory. So, like I said, we're going to meet with the mayor on Tuesday with, with Susan. Um, and we wanted to bring this to the commission today and see what your reaction was to see if it's something you would recommend and agree that we should pursue um, you know, before we have the meeting on Tuesday. Uh, again, it's still being flushed out. But since May, it, it's become clearer to us, you know, we have to drive to the dance and pay for the gas. However, we think National Grid wants to go with us, so. And the, uh, the point we said about the fund and it being over what the maximum is and, and that there's significant money in there, I, mean, I, I would hope that that wouldn't drive a decision on this, because we have to do something this morning. This is the first time any commission member has brought an idea, you know, a real concrete idea of, of how to use that fund and if there's, an if there's a need to use it or we decide you know, now's the time, we should put out something to the community for ideas. Maybe it'll come out of an energy form or something. So I hope when you meet the mayor, that's not like, you know, you know we got to figure out what to do with this money. Here's the perfect thing, you know, just because the opportunity is here. Point, point well taken. Right. And, and Bill, just to go to your point about, you know, being liable for the other third, I mean, clearly there's going to be a contract in this. Right. And it's going to be fully vetted, and Alan Seawall is going to be sitting with us at the table. And reviewing this and understanding what the parameters are uh, before any ink goes on those pages. Yeah. Well, I, I was assuming that, but I'm glad to hear you say it. Yeah. Into the microphones. Yeah.
into the microphone. <laughs> well, actually, it's that microphone. I don't. I can't imagine how much it's actually picked up in this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> See you later. Hi. Hi. But it, it, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, there's also the appealing aspect of, of making more, more robust our infrastructure uh, for emergency response. Uh, you know, we didn't fare as badly as other communities did after the October storm. For instance, as badly as East Hampton, which is one go, right? East Hampton was down for 12 days, I think. Um, but so far up there in Hills, it's hard to right. access. Well, you see, you know, it's, I just saw these people gathered up at the Cummington Creamery. I mean, it, it clearly, the first time I actually saw panic in the citizens of North Hampton's eyes, they couldn't get internet and their cell phones were <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> People were running around with Apple products and nowhere to use them, and they were terrified. And they all went to Cummington. They didn't go to Hollywood, they went to Cummington. So. But I, I, this is appealing, but I, I think the Aiden's cautionary point is that um, maybe before we buy a corsage for this dance, that we just be more circumspect as we go. With it. So, I guess um, even to add one more thing that almost feels like bait and switch and then uh, time pressure is that Ruben Warren is saying that they, 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 they expected the National Grid to move on this much faster and they have pushed Sandia back a number of times and that they have expected to kind of sign a new contract <laughs> and they're afraid if you push them that far enough time-wise they'll lose that um, uh, and they're cheap enough to get to work with these guys. So, uh, so that's the reason we brought it up to this, you know, kind of in, right. wondering if if um, the commission is willing to let the mayor make the call, and if he wants to make, I mean, obviously the mayor's going to make the call, but if he's right. going to look for a pot of money someplace, should we give him uh, uh, an okay to use the revolving fund? Well, uh, that actually makes sense. If yeah. It's an appropriate use of the revolving fund, in it, and insofar as that there we are We've achieved excess in that fund. It does make sense. It's not just a, a means of pushing so money down, to, right. to bring it down to a legal level. It's actually this is very appropriate. So it's I um, yeah. And, and as far as national grid goes, I mean I think taking David's analogy even a little further, we may end up picking up national grid hitchhiking. <laughs> I mean, they, and we might not even pick them up at their destination. They may just come along when they suddenly see everything moving on. I mean. Uh, clearly, to re, re, rely on their timeline is not in anyone's interest at this point. Anyway, sure, the revolving fund. So we're thirty thousand dollars over the seventy thousand that's under our city council approval. Well, we're not quite over that yet. So we haven't got an influx of money. Do you in, see that increasing and growing each year? And that revolving fund needs to be changed to reflect that. So we're not in a position that we got to get it down to seventy thousand. You, you know, I think Ian's point is absolutely right. That if we have that money, I think we would go back to Susan Wright and just discuss it. Because I think the 70000 is rather arbitrary. I, I, what I believe is that the revolving funds is a number of them that the city has. The city can only have a certain percentage of their budget That's correct. in these revolving funds. And one way they do that is they cap every one of them at 70000 So basically, that, that's kind of standard. You know, you start a revolving fund, you cap it at 70000 um, And they keep track of that so they know they don't get too much. They don't Go, go by that. So I think that's something we could have a conversation with this is right. But um, it also means that we don't just sit on the money um, and, and you know, we actually do something with it. So, so what, what do we get for $30,000? You get, um, uh, uh, you would have, working with the city, this group, Rivermore, would gather lots of information, they would interview key people throughout the community, they would, you would form a, um, a scoping, okay, here's the steps. You would, you would form a, um, uh, a small group to identify who are the key people that they need to talk to. You would have a kickoff meeting with all those folks. Um, you would identify the resources that we need to gather and they're quite extensive. Um, they've given us a list on them. Uh, and they would take the point in going out and then interviewing the key people as need be uh, to gather the data. Um, if National Grid wouldn't provide like one line drawings of their of their uh, infrastructure, then they would drive around and actually look at um, feeder poles and stuff and plot it out themselves. And this would all lead up to 
um, preparing a draft. <coughs> um, yeah, I guess it would be a draft plan. Yeah, I guess a draft, a draft plan. Uh, if everybody's in some agreement to that draft plan, then it would go to the next step. If there's some disagreement in the draft plan, there would be another kind of workshop um, with all the key players to try to come up with some agreement. And that would go into this one week long intensive. Or actually, maybe it's two days. I think he, they say I'll talk about two days and talk about a week. Uh, where we work with Sandia Labs. And Sandia Labs takes this information and feeds it into the computer and the programs and stuff and starts spitting out different scenarios. Um, at the end of that week, you basically have a plan that everybody agrees upon uh, in a number of different scenarios that they, they agree upon on what you could do to harden um, the key facility that you picked out. So, um, and, and then you pay millions of dollars to. That was my next question. Well, well if, it, if it comes after that, the, the impression I get is that, I mean, the city could reasonably expect to have to pay for some new generators. We might might be part of the strategic energy plan we identify. If we're going to put in a large array in the, in the city, it should go here. Because here, it could be tied into the grid and actually feed, you know, in emergency situations, it could be used. So that kind of thing. So we may, you know, want to do a third power, power you know, PV array sometime. Um, but when it comes to the, the dollars to redo the grid, or I think even the batteries is the impression I've gotten, but they, they switched once already, um, that national grid would have to cover that. So it doesn't mean that we have to spend any more money. You, they, you, you've been implying that we were looking at buying new generators anyhow. Right. So it might give us some more intelligence on where to put those generators and how to size. Yeah, what, what we end up with in areas of road with you know, ways to get to this sort of uh, we're safe, we're resilient, we have backup power, we don't lose power, we can continue you know, critical operations. And then it's a question of, well, how do we get there? We know, how, we know what the map is, but we know how do we do it? So you know, some of it clearly is capital expenditures through the capital process of the city. Some of it could be grant money, like Chris is bringing in all the time. Or uh, but some of it is going to definitely have to be the utilities because it's their systems that are going to get revamped. And that's something that we don't have any control over and we wouldn't be doing anything with. But at least we have this map that we can now follow to get us to where we want to be. What's your thought on the innovation? Sorry. No, I was just saying, I could see them not wanting to participate in the big one because of that. Or that could be a reason why they're trying to pull out from funding that part of, well, this isn't really helping us yet, but when they get to the point they decide if they're going to make improvements and then they step in, you said it was a three-phase process? You know, just initially the roadmap and then... The right. Program. I don't know exactly how many phases it is, but, you know, they've got to do, we have to do the analysis and the study to come up with the recommendations first. And then it's, all right, now how do we do the implementation? So one of the, so here's, the here's the reasons that the National Grid stated about kind of backing off on discovery of the cost. There were, there were two main reasons. <clears throat> Politically, they couldn't, they didn't want to be seen as uh, cherry picking a community. Um, you know, they have to be even in how they spend their money. So, why Northampton? Um, uh, you know, if we, if we go forward with this plan no matter what, then we're given a darn re reason why Northampton. Um, the second reason was, quite simply, they have to follow procurement rules. And um, that would delay things enormously, and it may not be this river more that they would pick. Um, and they were they were trying to, the last meeting we had, they basically said, can you break down your budget so that maybe we can identify this part comes from energy efficiency and this part comes from a slow pot, you know, and so they basically, they're trying to get around the procurement rules. They can't just spend, they just can't spend that one money on a sole source. So those are the two reasons they gave us, but it sounds to me like they do want to play. I mean, they've come to meetings here. They've been very, they, you know, they've been very engaged. Um, the other thing that's sketchy is that it costs three hundred thousand dollars the first time, and then it costs a hundred thousand dollars. Or what if they? And then thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. So what's what's, well, what's, what's happening that different <laughs> that it went from three hundred? It's like yeah, sure, I'll, I'll uh, buy you a fancy car for you know a hundred thousand dollars. No, you know I buy it for thirty thousand. It's like or I guess fill the house would be the better analogy. Like, well, I think, I mean, you start asking real questions. Well, well I think, I mean, well, I think that's reasonable, but I also think I think part of the play is the way Lisa Wayhart just described was originally 
there was more buying from the national grid, at least expressed more enthusiasm, which of course the number was floating around 300,000. So they were charging like utility rates. Right. So and then, and then suddenly the deep pockets sort of get a little shy, and yet Rivermore clearly benefits from this process. I mean, all players benefit from this, and it's, it's what's invested. There's also, let's not discount the sort of Damocles, which is the potential for the, this state to enact laws that will start to mandate and or offer I, its own money. Right. right. Use but, but and the fact is, is it's a one that may actually benefit us because we'll actually have shovel ready as it were, project ready to go. Second of all, it allows Rivermore to present itself as the uh, state authority on, on, on fitting out uh, and, and assessing cities. Mm -hmm. And it allows National Grid to throw in their brochure and their PR stuff to say, we were ahead of the curve. We anticipated the, the state's uh, uh, push on this. So, I mean, it, you know, in the politics of this, I mean, it benefits us. In, in parsing all that out, which is kind of important, I think, when we get down to what really, honestly, were the benefits for us. And and I think the benefits are a good sell. And the fact that we have a means, at least, to have somebody offer us, if we, honestly, if we were going to ask, pay for an assessment cold, if we just came to the, the decision that we needed to do this, and uh, without the, this being the incentive, it would cost us substantially more than $30,000 to have this kind of level of review with this much reporting uh, for the system. I really don't see us losing in that respect, um, but it does come with all those same cautions. If we're getting overly flattered, then if someone's smiling at us too brightly, then you got to feel a little squeamish and your pocket's about to get paid. <laughs> so, but I think that's part of their incentives. They're sitting there looking at New Jersey, looking at Connecticut, the next big storm, and there will be another big storm, and maybe it smacks us right here in the center part of the state, then suddenly the headlines are completely different. And then suddenly the state of Michigan actually more, actually be more productive if it actually hit Boston, because that's where the bulk of votes and the money are. And if that happened, you can be damn sure that the legislation would change in a heartbeat. And that could happen in a matter of weeks. We're in the middle of hurricane season. That could happen. If Sandy had veered just a little differently and hit Boston, Massachusetts would have been having these in place. So, or Boston. Or Boston. Or Boston. Mary's got a good point. Mary's got a good point. We are, in some cases, a separate state in, the, in, the, in regards. But. So, so I would, I mean, I, I totally get it. And I totally think it would be great to have a map of the best microgrids in the city to serve city facilities. You, I mean, it would serve all the citizens, presumably, if something, you know, were to hit. It wouldn't just be you know, one small group of people gets, you know, the benefit of this expenditure. So that, that makes total sense. And and if there's, you know, all that money left over, there's a lot of good stuff going on in here that presumably Mass CEC is not going to fund. But I'd like to hear about this. And, and it would be it would be nice to have something, you know, for the citizens of Northampton out of that revolving fund, you know, to, you know, really you know, be able to get some some really vi visible benefit from at the same time as Rivermore is, you know, padding their resume and, and you know, using us as their crown jewel. Yeah, I think, I think the more telling point is this, the investment in this is not mutually exclusive to other projects. And, and, um, that That's what the revolving fund is for, yeah. is to subsidize yeah. other projects. If, if this were jeopardizing another project at the expense of just pursuing this, those would be a, di a different subset, of, a different matrix. So, so. so how come we're already coming to talk to this group? Do you have any idea? Like, if they're aware, I mean, you presented, you know, there's the potential, there's this fund, and here's this group that approves expenditure from it. Well, it wasn't until just last week that they, I mean, it wasn't until this last week that, that they um, <clears throat> came up with this idea of, you know, if we could do a third of it. Yeah. So it'd be great to so, hear about I mean, like, how, like how we're doing the first time over places and yeah. what are the trends of the technology and, you know, what's, what's happening. If they're like, oh, this is our first time, maybe there's another group that can do it better. For well, Sandia, Sandia Labs is the big expert that they bring to the table. Yeah. And they've been doing it for, I mean, that's one of the reasons why. They have this really good deal for Sandia Labs because it's federally subsidized. 
So how does it yeah. work and how does it serve them in emergency situations? It would be, be great to see that as some you know, not understanding technology if they're trying to really sell and get the community on board and through this community angle fund. Do you think they'd be up for that? Uh, to presenting? Yeah, yeah. explaining how this benefits mm -hmm. the community and meets our right. energy goals and all that I stuff. I, I assume if we had invited them, they would have showed up tonight. <laughs> um, we wanted to have a conversation without them in the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Believe me, they can talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I actually feel right now a little more comfortable dishing on them while they're not here. So, you the guys. And I've got to say, it, it was after our meeting last week when you know it was clear that you know Grid wanted to sort of like sit on the sidelines a little bit and not drive to the dance. And after Rivermore left, and, you know, they laid out for us, you know, we'll, we'll eat 30% and, you know, we, we're going to ask you to put 33% on the table. That after they left, I said to Chris, I said, you know, we do have the revolving loan fund. That could be a possibility. Uh, you know, okay, and, uh, yeah. and we wanted, we just didn't want to have them sitting here when we had that discussion. Right. So. And if the commission doesn't think it's a good idea, I mean, we're still certainly talking to the mayor about it, and, and he'll have to find, the, if he wants to go for it, he'll have to find the pot of money. Um, but if it moves fast, didn't want to, if, if this was the pot of money that made the most sense, I didn't want to have to wait for another month or call a special meeting. So I thought it was worth bringing it up. We are going to ask the mayor to call Rick Sullivan at, at uh, Environmental Affairs you know, and see if it, maybe there's something we can do statewide. You know, we're already looked at by grid and you know, is there some sort of a pilot effort we could do fast. Yeah. So. so do you need a vote on this? Yeah. Yeah, if the commission is willing to take a vote on it. We need so, a motion. Yeah, I will will make a motion. I think it's I think it's we have more to gain than lose, I think, in terms of with this juncture with this version of the commitment and with this resource and with that whole uh, eyes wide open. It's a path we're on where we need to be on. So I'm um, I'm supportive of it. So, but it's just to be. Um, to What's be clear. the motion? Yeah, is the motion, is the motion needed to approve use of revolving funds yeah. for this purpose? Or is it to recommend to the mayor that? What's your well, the um, I think it's. Uh, the ordinance says that it has to be approved by the energy commission and the mayor to spend any money from the revolving fund. So. <clears throat> uh, so you know whether that's so we read as approval today. Yeah. So it was a, right. I mean, whether that's a whether that's a you know read as the energy commission recommends the mayor, um, or in this case it may be that the energy commission um, uh, you know approves this type of expenditure and defers to the mayor to make the final decision or something like that. Um, so basically, giving him permission to tap into this fund. If he so feels it's, you know, valid for what we use, because it sounds like there's still a lot of things that haven't been. Well, the specifics would be for uh, how do we want to put it? But for this initial um, well, partnership, multi-phase assessment and study, yeah. right. uh, and development of recommendations for resiliency, including microgrid capability. Okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> is that the motion? Yeah. So, is that the motion? <laughs> I will second the motion that I will reiterate right now. Is there a cap? I'm second the motion that, that we authorize uh, utilization of, well, or do you want to put a dollar amount on yes. it? Put it as much as? Not to exceed? Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. They're, they're telling us $33,000. All right, not to exceed $33,000 authorized from the volume fund for purposes of pursuing um, uh, uh, an assessment plan from Rivermore in partnership or actually hiring? That's the other question. I, mean, I remember you said the term, you used the term partnership. Are we, are we commissioning a study or are we actually going in partnership? And that's kind of going just collaborating with the study. We're paying someone. Right. Yeah, we're paying for something. something. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're, I think we're hiring. We are hiring. Well, actually, $33,000 to be applied towards the How about that? I'm sorry. Uh, $33,000 to be applied towards the assessment for right. the microgrid and uh, 
emergency management system ordinance or contribution? No. Not a contribution. No. Apply to. No, apply, apply to. to and it doesn't have to, so we don't have to get bid. There's no procurement process. Well, that, that also the other piece. The, the yeah. only yeah. way you can do it, even, I mean, national grid would be the sole source. There's no one else around. Right. But Rivermore would be the question if national grid is tied in with Rivermore and the contracts with national grid, if you're a consultant or a sub consultant, it takes away that procurement process. It's a sole source procurement. Right. 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 So, but yeah. if national grid isn't on board, then Technically, you need to get formal quotes over right. 25,000. Belt and RFP. For specific services. And Rivermore, yeah. we educated them on that process the other day. Yeah. That could be a possibility. Well, we should charge them for that education. About <laughs> 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 $30,000. Okay, you <laughs> better procure Massachusetts procurement law. $32,000. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, it'd be very clean and easy if National Grid was on board with this and was leading the oh, way. Absolutely. And, this is our obligation to National Grid to make this program work. Yeah. Well, it, it may be that the conversation with the mayor and with Joe, our procurement officer, leads to something like that, yeah. and we go back to National Grid and say, look, the city's you know, willing to do this, but we can't in a timely manner without you. Um, you yeah, know, for, the, for the same reason they're balking is because of their pro procurement restrictions. We right. have similar constraints. So. Right, and we have to get through those before this could possibly get forward. You have something? Well, that's well, the, well, the motion, right? Okay. Did you just wait? I think Christina's going to try to read it. to make it? Oh, you're going to read it. Oh, you're going to read it. I'm not sure that we awesome. have quite a few started. <laughs> the motion to approve the spending of not, well, not to exceed 33000 from the revolving loan fund for the multi phase assessment study with Rivermore. But we said we didn't want to say in partnership. No. I'm probably not even more actually if I think about it. Right. Yeah. No. I think actually to to towards an assessment. Yeah, towards, towards the assessment. Uh, yeah. 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 We apply towards an assessment. Applied, and so we don't stipulate who, we don't stipulate mm -hmm. what. So we're authorizing thirty three thousand dollars towards an assessment of um how we want to put the micro prison. Resiliency plan. Resiliency plan. plan. Oh yes, that's my motion. <laughs> I don't know. Well, we're not. Well, we're not. With the approval, with the recommendation or approval of the mayor, right? That goes without saying. Okay. It yeah. can't can be done without the mayor's right. sign. So this isn't to say, give the mayor the approval to say approve the expenditure right. for some kind of microgrid assessment. Right. Any more discussion? I just want to say that at the community forum, there was a conversation about microgrids, and I know it's technically something different, but just keeping that language so open and basic, it seems like there's an opportunity for us to consider other ideas about microgrid as to benefit the community specifically, not just this specific opportunity relationship. Right. Toward, towards that, Hayden, I'll say that if any microgrid is going to happen, this is the way the first one's going to happen. Any, in any community, it's going to be based on emergency response. But the learning curve that happens in the beginning of that can then provide an opportunity to expand sure. it out farther and farther. But, yeah, I, was, I was thinking we're taking the first step towards that. When you're talking about that, that actually having it implemented, if it gets implemented, that it's a great uh, educational tool for promoting for uh, you know comprehensive community use and introducing it. He, he to just say we have here an example where it works, and you guys remember what happened in the last storm. We just remember what building saved it, and that's because of our investment in the system. I think that makes that's a whole lot more illustrative than say when we start speaking in our yada yada terms about you know the value of microgrids. And I'm trying to sell this also for communication systems and, and broadband, but you know I've got I've got a, it's a but on, on that angle, saying you know, holding it up as a poster child, national grid should be involved 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, would, yeah. you would think. Yeah, and yeah. that's they should yeah, be banging on the door. door. Well, this is also the way to get, to get them to get buy in as well. I mean, as I said, they don't seem particularly courageous. And so, right. if, if they've got coverage, political coverage, by the fact that it's established here, and they, they, oh, okay. All right. And it, it 
it's more likely to be able to persuade them. Unless the whole thing goes south and falls apart, in which case then, of course, we're held to close to the status. I'm showing for the idea and concept and I think finding state, central state money to help with it um, and, and is a good way to go, but to just approve it with as open as it is and hearing how this relationship started and evolved, I'm not on board. It doesn't feel, doesn't feel right. Nobody the national grid now. <laughs> <laughs> any, fur any further discussion? Any further discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions or anything? Okay. Everybody, uh, all, all but eight. Is that a quorum? Yeah, we have a quorum. Okay. Um, let's see, what, how much time do we have left? Zero. Oh, zero time. Zero. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Clear the building.